ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ben McIntyre and Johan Sorensen. I, I should say, if anyone's looking for Suzanne Summers, <laughs> you're in the wrong place. You're in the wrong room. Be ben could do a, a reasonably good impression. Um, I won't be remotely offended if you wish to go to Suzanne Summers. But yes. To see that. Oh, there you go. There we there go. There good. I mean, seriously, yeah, yeah, because yeah. I think there has been a sort of switch of rooms. So if you, if you, if you wish to go, please do. Um, good. Well, good, good morning. Um, uh, uh, you know, delighted. To, uh, also, another change is, is there, there was supposed to be another couple of people. Uh, unfortunately, illness means means that they're not attending. Um, so, so you're, you're somewhat stuck with, with, with Ben and I. Um, ben is an, an associate editor at The Times, which is based in London, and uh, an international bestseller and sort of um, the, the man who knows about espionage and, and the history of it all it, it kind of around the world, but, but particularly in, in England. And... Um, I'm going to give a little anecdote of my own. So the, my first introduction to Ben's work was uh, I was very fortunate to be at, at, a, at a beautiful um, estate in Northern Ireland uh, where we were hosted by the Duke of Abercorn. And, and he'd served in the Coldstream Guards. Mm. He'd been an Ulster Unionist MP, um, kind of very sharp, massive library. And I was, I was uh, and, and clearly kind of knew the corridors of power fairly well. And as I was leaving, he, he kind of thrust a spy among his friends into my hand. And he, with a mixture of kind of glee and anger, saying, you have to read this book. It is the most marvelous book. I despise it <laughs> because, unfortunately, it's all bloody true. Mm. Um, so that was my first introduction. So... I'll, I'll kind of hand it over to you. Well, lovely. I mean, The Spy Among Friends was a book I wrote, it was sort of two books ago, and it was, it's the story of Kim Philby, um, who was probably the most, actually certainly the most effective double agent in history. Um, Kim Philby was recruited by Stalin's intelligence service in the 1930s as a very young and idealistic communist, and he worked his way into British intelligence. I won't tell the whole story now, but, but, but on, on essentially on the NKVD's orders. The NKVD was the precursor of the KGB. He was ordered to get himself into British intelligence and then to systematically betray uh, MI6 from within. But he did much more than that. He became very close friends with two critical people. One was a, a man called Nicholas Elliott who rose to become the deputy head of MI6. And the other was a man called James Angleton, uh, a name that some of you may know. James Angleton... Uh, was in, in Britain during the war because he was there with the OSS, which was the precursor to the CIA. But he rose to become the head of counter-espionage uh, within the CIA. And Philby ended up as head of MI6 in Washington. And he would meet with James Angleton every week in a, in a restaurant called Harvey's in downtown Washington. And as one CIA officer said, Philby picked him clean. He picked him clean of just about every single secret that Angleton had. And he sent them all back to the KGB in, in Moscow. And so for almost, uh, almost a decade, almost every CIA operation uh, and joint MI6 CIA operation was, was destroyed by Philby. Hundreds of people died. Probably thousands of people died, actually. Um, uh, in particular because of an operation that involved Albania dropping anti-communist agents into Albania who were, who were actually greeted by name by the waiting security services of Albania and then captured, in many cases tortured, uh, and then killed, and their entire families wiped out. So the blood, the blood toll on, on this particular story is extremely high. And it drove Angleton, who, who became very senior in the CIA, it drove him really completely mad. Um, Angleton became convinced, because Philby eventually defected to Moscow, and Angleton became convinced that the CIA was riddled with Soviet spies, uh, all being run at a distance by Philby. Uh, he was almost completely wrong. There were one or two who'd, who'd been picked up by the KGB, but mostly the CIA was clean. But, but Angleton very nearly destroyed it. 
And in fact, he did, he did such an effective job of damaging the morale of, CIA, of the CIA that quite a lot of people subsequently believed that Angleton himself must have been a KGB agent because he'd done so much damage to the organization. So I sort of introduced that by way of saying that quite often people think that spying makes not much difference, that actually if you've penetrated an enemy organization and they've penetrated yours, that it's a kind of zero-sum game. You end up more or less where you were at the beginning. And I think that is often the case. But there are one or two cases, and they're mostly the ones that I try to write about, that actually have a fundamental impact on the course of Western and, and indeed, you know, Soviet history. That, that particularly the struggle between um, the West and the Soviet Union was a, a vital part of, the, of, of a war that never broke out into a hot war, but the Cold War was mostly espionage. And, and we see today lots of, we were discussing this earlier, Johan and I, that a lot of what we're seeing today in terms of international intelligence and espionage is, is straight out of the KGB playbook. Um, Putin is a, is a highly sophisticated, well-trained KGB officer. Uh, as he himself once said, uh, the KGB is a club you never leave. And the principles that, that he, he learned while in the KGB do inform the modern Russian government. I think espionage has never been impo more important than it is today. Uh, I, well, I guess what, what we hear about today is, all, you know, around data theft and, and remote espionage. And I mean, it's a hot topic. What, what's the role of the human element of, of, of the kind of intelligence services? Where does that fit in today? Because you've written, you know, you, you, you've been read you have a book coming out this year which I do. references some of it. I do. I mean, there's always been a sort of not quite a conflict, but a certain rivalry within all intelligence services between what they call humint and sigint. So human intelligence and signals intelligence. Now, in the war, signals intelligence was principally wireless interception. So it was the Bletchley Park Enigma code breakers who, who sort of performed the signals intelligence role. And obviously that was absolutely vital during the war. But human intelligence was, was much more important during the war, I would, or not more important, but equally as important. Today, we have a vast preponderance of signals intelligence. I mean, it's texts, emails, everything electronic that you do is being picked up, well, not necessarily read, not necessarily what, you, what you're writing, and certainly not what I'm writing, but, um, but you know, there is a capacity to pick up pretty much all signals intelligence. But human intelligence is, is just as important as it always was. Because in order, for, in order for you to know what is going down on the text messages of the ISIS coordinator in Raqqa, you still have to know what kind of iPhone he's got. You still need to know when he's on the phone. You still need to have somebody with eyes on him. So actually the human intelligence element is just as important as it's always been. And arguably, because signals intelligence is becoming much more penetrated than it ever was, Human intelligence is, is beginning to become more important again because all spy agencies have realized that, that if you write something digitally, it is vulnerable. And so a lot of them are going... In fact, I discovered this the other day, that the, the, um, the Russian, uh, the SVR, the, the Russian Foreign Intelligence Service, has just ordered a 1,000 German manual typewriters um, because they're going back to typing things on paper. Um, and once things are on paper, then you need a human... You need somebody to be able to lift it or copy it or get hold of it. So it's always been a balance between human intelligence and signals intelligence. And it would be a mistake to assume that human spies are no longer needed because they're probably more needed than ever, I would say. Yeah. I mean, there, we, we, we kind of almost have public advertising now for MI5, MI6 mm. in England. I mean, it's, it, th there is a big recruitment drive. So Oh, huge. Um, I mean, we've sort of caught up with America in that respect. I mean, the CIA was always much more open in its in its recruitment. MI6 and MI5, MI5 is the internal security service of, of the British um, government, and so it, it's roughly equivalent to the FBI, and MI6 is the external um, intelligence gathering uh, network, which is, of course, similar to the CIA. Um, and, and up until about 10 years ago, um, MI6 didn't officially exist at all. I mean, it was not an acknowledged organ of government. I mean, to report the colour of the carpets inside MI6 was itself an offence. 
um, you know, so they were, they were uh, but that's changed. It's it very, was. It was. So what is the colour of the carpet? Uh, I can tell you they're blue. They're blue, right. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, and in fact, they do, they recruit openly. You know, you, you can look in, in pages of the newspapers and it says, um, they're slightly conflicted MI6 because although they, they sort of disavow being James Bond's kind of intelligence service, they actually love all of that. <laughs> um, so I if you look carefully at the MI6 literature, there's always a reference to 007 in it somewhere, while at the same time they say it's nothing like that at all. <laughs> Um, could you tell us a little bit about Oleg? Yes, this is the book I've just finished. In fact, I haven't, um, I haven't this, you're the first audience I will have described this, this book to, so it's a very small exclusive. Um, I've just finished a book about an extraordinary Russian spy uh, called Oleg Gordievsky. Um, Gordievsky was a senior KGB colonel in the 1970s and 80s, and he, he, he was and is an extraordinary man. He, um, he almost unilaterally began a campaign against the KGB from inside it. And he was recruited by British intelligence in, in, uh, in Denmark in the 1970s. And for nearly 20 years, he produced an astonishing stream of really high-grade um, intelligence material. And he rose up through the ranks steadily, uh, and he ended up as head of the KGB in London. And so every week in London, he would go to a safe house in, in, in Bayswater where he would meet his case officers and he would download. Uh, he had a prodigious memory. He would download everything that he'd memorized from that week. And the material he was producing, uh, and this does have modern relevance, was so good that it, it, was reaching, it was being passed on to the CIA and then being passed on to the Oval Office. So it was going straight to Reagan's desk in the, in the early 80s. But, uh, and it was very important because it was, it was drawing attention to the fact that, that the Reagan administration believed that the Kremlin was essentially kind of filled with paranoid um, geriatrics that were, that, were, that were not really a threat. What they didn't realize and that Oleg revealed was that actually fear of a, of a Western first strike, fear that there was going to be a nuclear strike by the Soviets, was genuine, heartfelt, and profound. Um, and it actually changed Soviet policy, it changed uh, Western policy towards the Soviets, and was one of the reasons really why the very early moves towards perestroika and glasnost started, because Oleg was able to do an amazing thing, really. He was able to, to reveal what the Kremlin was thinking to the West, but he was also able to shape Kremlin policy. He was that senior, so he was kind of briefing both sides uh, while working all the time for the West. The irony here was that although MI6 was passing Oleg's material to the, the Oval Office, um, as is traditional in intelligence services, they were disguising the source. They would never reveal to the CIA where this stuff was coming from uh, because they had to protect the source. Well, the CIA doesn't really like that very much. It's, it's, it, 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 as a sort of global, almost imperial power, the CIA expects to know where this stuff comes from. Uh, so they set up a task force secretly without telling the Brits. They set up a, a unit to investigate where the Brits were getting this information from. So effectively, the CIA was spying on, on MI6. <laughs> and they did it. It was an amazing job. They worked it out. They, they spent a lot of money and a lot of time, and they worked out who Oleg was. But what the CIA didn't know was that the head of that task force was a man called Aldrich Ames, who was himself, as you all know, I can tell from the murmur around the room, was recruited by the KGB. So you've got a sort of perfect circle here, which is the... the the KGB is spying on the CIA, is spying on MI6, is spying on the KGB. <laughs> so it goes all the way around. And Aldrich Ames, I think I, we can pretty much prove this now. Aldrich Ames was an extreme, in, in many ways, one of the pleasures of writing this book is the contrast between, between Oleg's motivation to become a double agent, to become a betrayer, and, and Ames's motivation. Ames is motivated by money. I mean, he, he, he wants to make cash. He's got a very expensive new wife. He doesn't like the car he's driving. His house is too small. He wants the money. And the KGB is happy to provide it. In the end, the KGB provided him with the equivalent of about $4 million um, over the course of about 15 years of spying. Most of it literally stuffed into plastic bags. Um, and Aldrich James betrayed Oleg. I mean, he, he, it, one of the first things he did when he, when he contacted the KGB in, in Washington in 1985 was to produce Oleg's identity. 
And Ehrlich, by this point, had been appointed head of the KGB in London, as I said, and, he, uh, and a message came through from the Kremlin, from, from the Lubyanka, in fact, the headquarters of, of, of the KGB, summoning him back to Moscow, ostensibly to anoint him as the head of the KGB in London. And there was a big debate in MI, within MI6 about whether Oleg should return, whether it was too dangerous, whether this might be some kind of a trap. And it was decided that it was safe enough. They had no other intelligence indicating there was a problem. So Oleg, with incredible bravery, uh, in, in June 1985, flew back to Moscow. Couldn't tell whether he was being followed at the airport. And he went to his old apartment, and he opened the top lock with his keys, and he opened the second lock, but he couldn't open the door because the third lock had been locked but he didn't have the key for the third lock. He'd never had the key for the third lock. So he knew at that moment that the KGB were onto him. And there then followed this incredible cat and mouse escape because Oleg had an escape plan in place. C could you tell us a little bit about it? Is it well, the escape plan is straight out of John le Carre. I mean, it's kind of... Um, it, and the woman who, who set it up is herself a brilliant Le Carre character. Uh, I won't tell you her real name, but um, she, she still lives in, in the home county. She's sort of one of those twin set and pearls, lovely upper middle class English ladies who insist on having tea at 3.15. And she, um, but she'd set up this escape signal. Uh, uh, the escape, in order to trigger the escape, Oleg had to be seen, believe it or not, holding a Safeways plastic bag on the corner of a particular street in Moscow at a particular time of day on a Tuesday. And this escape site, this signal site, had been policed by MI6 for a dozen years. Every Tuesday, whether or not Oleg was in Moscow or not, somebody had to have eyes on the, that corner of the street to see if there was a man. They'd never seen a photograph of him. They had no idea who he was. It was that secret. But if a man was standing there with a Safeways bag, that was the signal the escape was on. And the acceptance for it, believe it or not, the sign that, that Oleg could know that his signal had been picked up was one of the MI6 officers had to walk past him eating a Mars bar. <laughs> um, and so, for a dozen years, every MI6 officer on a Tuesday evening went out to this corner of the street with a, with a, to ostensibly to buy bread with a Mars bar in his pocket, um, or her pocket. And, um, and in fact, one of them told me recently, he said, I, I could never eat a Mars bar <laughs> afterwards. He said it would put him off Mars bars for life. And that's what happened. I mean, it's, a, it's an incredibly exciting story. And... and after many twists and turns, Oleg did manage to fly the escape signal that was picked up by, um, by MI6. And then the next stage of it went into operation, which meant that Oleg had to get himself to the border of Finland. He had actually to get to the, to the spot where, where Lenin had entered the Soviet Union in, in 1917 to, to kick off the October Revolution. It was the same border post. Um, and he had to be in a particular lay-by behind a particular rock at 2.30, four days later. So he had to throw off KGB surveillance, first of all, then he had to get into a train under a different name. Then he had to take a bus. Then he had to take another train. Then he had to double back. Then he had to walk to this lay-by. Meanwhile, two MI6 cars had left the British Embassy uh, in, in Moscow um, at, under a very elaborate kind of ruse indicating that they were going for medical treatment in Helsinki in, in Finland. They had to screech into the... They had, they had to throw off KGB surveillance as well. They had to get into this lay-by. Then Oleg was put in the boot of one of the cars because, of course, diplomatic cars, theoretically, are allowed to pass through border posts without being searched. I say theoretically because if the KGB suspected there was someone in the boot of a car, they weren't going to hesitate to, to open it. So Oleg was put in the boot of the car. He was drugged. They wrapped him in a special space blanket so that he wouldn't pick up the heat sensors that existed on the border when they were going through. And they drove up through the, the, the border post. And as they were going, so, so there were two sets of MI6 officers, what, two male officers and their wives. I mean, it, it, under British rules, the spouses of MI6 officers are allowed to be uh, indoctrinated into, into operations. And one of them had brought along a baby. Uh, a tiny sort of 16-month-old baby uh, was in the back seat of the car. And as they were going through the border post, they were stopped. And the sniffer dogs began going around the boot of the car in which Oleg was, was hidden. Uh, and with incredible foresight, the, uh, the, the, the woman in the front of the car took her little baby out of the back, who had obligingly just filled her nappy, her diaper, <laughs> placed the baby on the boot of the car, on, underneath which Oleg was lying, took the, the dirty nappy off and dropped it on one of the dogs, which went, <laughs> you know, kind of... Um, and the, the smell of the dirty nappy masked the smell of Oleg inside the, the, 
And the owner of that dirty nappy, this is the bit I love most, um, the owner of that dirty nappy is now 33 and is head of Russian art at Sotheby's in New York. Um, <laughs> she has absolutely no idea that her dirty nappy changed the course of the Cold War. She will when your book comes she out. She will presumably. when the book comes out. She'll be <laughs> jolly surprised, although I'm having to disguise her father's identity. But so having got through that bit, they then actually did then get into Finland, and the two officers in the front of the, of the car had prepared a tape, which they put in, because they, couldn't, they couldn't, obviously couldn't stop, because Finland was still dangerous territory, but they, they put a tape on the, on the cassette deck and cranked it up to full volume, and, and the, 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 what they played was Sibelius's Finlandia, <laughs> to indicate to Oleg in the boot that he was, he was free and he was out. So, so that's the story of Oleg Gordievsky, who still lives, uh, believe it or not, in a safe house in South London, where he's been under guard for the last 33 years. And he has a, you know, it's quite a life. I mean, he, he is under threat still. I mean, Putin has a particular animus for this story um, because Putin was a young KGB officer in Leningrad at the time. And the Leningrad station was the one that was supposed to be responsible for surveillance of diplomatic personnel entering and leaving the country. And they, 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 made, they made a mistake. And everybody in, in Putin's um, office was purged. So he has a, he has a particular <coughs> anger about this story. So Oleg is still, uh, still, is still a man under threat. Um, it's extraordinary. Kind of reading through your books, uh, Spy Amongst Friends, I mean, it's heartily recommended. It's wonderfully written. And, and the, I was thinking it, it, it could have been called One of Us. I mean, it is just... Uh, how it describes how the British intelligence system came to be and the complete bonkersness of, of, of how it operated. But it seemed effective. The CIA clearly seemed effective. The German, the Abwehr, not so much mm. in many ways. But the thread throughout your books is the Russians are very good. They're brilliant at it. I mean, to coin a phrase, nobody does it better. I mean, it's... Um, and it's taught. I mean, there was a school, uh, it still exists, I think, at, outside Moscow, that was once called School 101. It then became the Yuri Andropov Red Banner Institute, where Catch intelligence it. techniques... Catchy title? Catchy title. Well, 101, I think it's an... In, I don't think they knew it, that it's an inadvertent echo of, of George Orwell's Room 101. I don't... You know, I mean... But they... You know, f right from the earliest days of the Cheka, which was the Bolshevik intelligence organisation... Russia realized that, that actually you can teach, you can, you can train spies in, in various techniques, and you can see them happening today. Um, and Oleg went to School 101, so, and he was the one of the ones who revealed the full extent of KGB um, sort of operations. I mean, for example, just to give you one example, th there's a there was a directorate within um, the KGB called Directorate S, which was responsible for planting what were known in Russian jargon as nielegal, illegals. Now, illegals are spies who are implanted in, in foreign countries under different names as ordinary citizens. Um, they're not KGB officers. They are agents, but they're kind of freelance agents. And, and in the 1970s and 80s, there were thousands of them. I mean, there was a global army of illegals all over the world. And in fact, they, I don't know if you've seen The Americans, which is a slightly sort of fanciful take on the whole thing. But it's not wrong. Um, and and it, Western intelligence believe that today there are probably more sleepers, is another name for them, agents of this sort that are spread around the world under different guises. Um, and, and that's just one of the ways that the KGB established presences in, in, in foreign countries. And Oleg's job when he was working for the KGB in London was to run the illegals network in London. And they had a fantastically complicated system for sort of contacting illegals because, of course, you couldn't be... It, the KGB knew they were being followed in London and, and Washington and elsewhere. So making contact with illegals was very difficult. But they had this wonderfully complicated set of, of, of techniques for doing it. It's called a brush contact when you, when you pass information to somebody else without actually seeing them. Or, or indeed, a dead letter boxes. That was the other way they would do it, is leaving signals in different places that would indicate either that they needed to pick up money or that there was information to be picked up for them. So it, the, the, the whole system was wildly complicated but incredibly effective, and it still is. So how did that work if they had that and Oleg was running them, mm. um, but he was working for MI6? Does that mean 
because there's a tension, there's always a tension if you're a double agent about how much you actually, you know, because they were also feeding back useful information. Yeah. You have to, otherwise you're, you're going to be right. I mean, Philby was the classic example. Yeah. It wasn't that he was entirely ineffective on either side. Yeah. Um, well, you've put your finger on, on a very important point. I mean, the problem with running agents at all, I mean, if you have an agent inside the enemy camp, say, and he is or she is providing high-grade information about spies that are in your camp, if you start sweeping them all up, pulling them off, that's going to expose him. The, the, the KGB is going to realize they've got a spy in their midst. So one of the ironies of Oleg's vast amount of information that he was producing that was a lot of it was not actionable because it was too good. You know, so what they had to do, and in fact, there was a good example of this recently in the news, the, the Chinese, the suspected CIA double agent who was arrested a couple of weeks ago. Now, that was someone that they'd, they'd had eyes on for a long time. They'd suspected him for a long time, but they knew if they pulled him in, that would, that would expose their own source. So they let him run, and that was the case with a lot of Oleg's people. That he, so, for example, he identified a number of Soviet spies, people who'd, who'd agreed to spy for the KGB in Norway and Denmark and other parts of Scandinavia. But the Scandinavian governments, while they knew that this was true, just decided to watch them, just to keep an eye on them, because they knew that if they pulled them in, if they simply arrested them, the KGB would then start to mount its own internal mole hunt, and Oleg himself would become exposed. So you've got this funny tension where, in a, in a strange way, the better the information the spy is producing, the less you can do with it. Right. Um, because you, you risk exposing your own spy. So it's a weird kind of... Angleton used to call it a wilderness of mirrors because the truth is it, it sort of reflects and refracts back on itself all the time. And I, we said earlier that the Russians were very good at it. I mean, they were very good at it, but they also made some hilarious mistakes. I mean, for example, most of you will have heard of the so-called Cambridge Five, who were the five Cambridge-educated um, KGB agents in, in London. Philby, McLean, Burgess, uh, Cairn Cross, and um, I think the other one, uh, Blunt. Uh, who ended up being keeper of the Queen's pictures. These were, these were very high-level KGB agents. And during the war, they were feeding back tremendous amounts of material. Now, of course, the Soviets and, and, and the British and the Americans were all on the same side in the Second World War. So you, they could justify it to themselves that it wasn't particularly dangerous, that they were simply alerting Stalin to something that he ought to have known about. And, for example, you know, the D-Day deception plan, that was all fed back to Moscow it, it, I mean, Stalin knew about it before he was officially told about it by Churchill. So it was a sort of back channel. Um, it, it was dangerous because, of course, the KGB had itself been penetrated by German intelligence. Right. So there was a big danger that quite a lot of the material that the, these British spies were, were sending back to Moscow would end up in German hands. Uh, and some of it, there's some evidence that some of it did, actually. But the hilarious aspect of it is that over the course of the war... Um, these five spies, as I say, were sending back really high-grade material. And there was, a, there was a, a senior KGB officer in Moscow called Nadia Modrinskaya. She was one of the very few women, um, senior women officers in the KGB, whose job it was to analyze um, all material coming from the, from the Cambridge Five. And she studied this stuff over the course of a year. And it's a, it's a truism in, in intelligence that if something looks perfect, if something looks absolutely ideal, if it ticks every single box, it's probably a fake. And so she read everything that was coming from it, and it was really high-grade stuff from the Cambridge Five, put it all together and said, this all agrees with itself. You know, it, it, uh, they're corroborating each other, and therefore it must all be a conspiracy. So for about two years, everything that arrived from the Cambridge Five was simply dismissed as being part of some vast MI6 um, sort of conspiracy, when it was all true. Um, so, so, you know, you can look too hard at something um, for too long and, and get it completely backwards. So they weren't that great. Um, I mean, it's the thing of, of the person who wins is, is the one who knows who knows what the other person doesn't know that knows what the person mm. knows. That's beautifully put. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's, that's exactly... It's, it's, it's that strange continuum of kind of... I know that you know that I know that you know. And where you are on it is <coughs> anybody's bet at any given time. But that's why, you know, something... We, to go back to signals intelligence, that's why the Bletchley Park intercepts, the fact that, that Britain and America by association was able to read in almost real time 
what the Abwehr, the German intelligence service, was thinking and doing was, was an amazing advantage because, of course, the Germans had no idea that their most secret messages were being routinely picked up and read. And so there was a way, therefore, of, of testing the sort of material that, you, that, that Britain and America were gathering because you could test it against what the Germans thought they were getting. And that was vitally useful for running double agents um, because at the beginning of the war, when... Uh, um, the Germans started pouring spies into Britain and America, but mostly into Britain. They didn't know that they were all being picked up because of the Bletchley Park um, Enigma breakthrough. And so they were all picked up, these, these, these various spies. And some of them were hilariously incompetent. I mean, they would arrive with not speaking any English and completely <laughs> unaware of the way that the system worked. They came by boat and aeroplane <laughs> and all sorts of different places. But they were all picked up. Um, and then they started to use them as double agents, feeding misinformation back to the Germans. And it became a huge um, project called the Double... Well, it was run by something called the Twenty Committee. Uh, it was called the Twenty Committee because 20 in Roman numerals is a double cross. And <laughs> that was the kind of joke they liked. Um, and and they, they fed huge amounts of, of false information that enabled the, the Sicilian landings... Uh, to take place without uh, much opposition, and actually underpinned the D-Day landings, were underpinned by an enormous double agent operation. But the reason that worked, really, is because Bletchley Park could test what, they were s what was being sent to the Germans and could test what the Germans were reacting to without the Germans knowing it. So if you've got that kind of signals intelligence breakthrough, it's an amazing advantage. I mean, Operation Mincemeat, and I guess Eddie Chapman, or, you know, zigzag, mm. uh, you know, the Bletchley runs through both of those. Yeah. Wi without that, it's hard to tell if, if they would have known where they were on the who knows what. That's about exactly who. right. I mean, the, 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 what Johan's referring to is, actually the first book I wrote about, it, about espionage was about a character called uh, Eddie Chapman, who was a, who was a high-rolling gangster in the 1930s. He was a sort of charming con man and crook and, and blackmailer, fraudster. Um, but charming. Lovely. Oh, I mean, really. tremendously entertaining and good fun and very, very handsome. And he ended up in jail in Jersey, in the Channel Islands, in 1941, when the Germans invaded the Channel Islands. The Channel Islands were the only part of, the British, um, uh, of Britain that were actually occupied by the Nazis. And Chapman was in jail at that point, ha and facing an enormous um, sentence back in London. And he did a deal uh, with, the, with the Germans that if they trained him um, and dropped him back into Britain, he would then spy for them against Britain, uh, on the understanding that since he was facing such an enormous uh, sentence in, in, in London, he'd never betray them. And that's what they did. They trained him up in this extraordinary spy school in southern France in sabotage operations and, and wireless um, stuff and unarmed combat and things. And they, they dropped him into, into Cambridgeshire at the end of 1941. And he landed in the middle of the night and fell over, broke his nose, and, and immediately defected to MI5. Um, uh, as Agent Zigzag. And they called him Agent Zigzag because they were never quite sure whose side he was really on. Because he then went back. Well, he went back again. Yeah, he, <laughs> then, he, he, was the on, he was the only... He was the only British citizen to be awarded the Iron Cross for bravery by the German <laughs> government. So they trusted him totally. And he, and he went back into... He, he, they, I mean, after a series of almost unbelievable adventures, he got himself back into occupied Europe. And they were, he was debriefed and interrogated, and, and they utterly believed in him. He became a kind of very senior spy um, for the Germans. And then they parachuted him back into Britain in 1944. And his main job in 1944 was to direct the V1s and V2s, the rockets that, that Hitler was firing from continental Europe to try and obliterate London. Um, and, and Chapman's job was to do target spotting, really, was to report back by wireless to, to Berlin the damage that was being done by the V1s and V2s. And it was a, it's a rather brilliant operation. They, um, they worked out that, that the Germans were actually firing short, that quite a lot of, their, uh, of the rockets were falling short of London. The main target was St. Paul's in the middle of London, but they were dropping short. So, so it was worked out that if Chapman could persuade them they were firing long, they would shorten their aim even more. Okay, and so therefore, the V1s and V2s, instead of landing in London, would land in, in the fields of Kent. Um, which is what happened, and which was kind of tough on the farmers of Kent. <laughs> but it was... <laughs> awful. It was pretty... And it's, funnily enough, it's one of the very few bits of these files that are still t t uh, classified. Mm -hmm. They won't release the precise targeting because it's probably still legally a bit, you know, 
deciding that these people can die and those people can't is a kind of slightly legally tricky area. So, so that doesn't come out. But it was a hugely successful operation, and, and, and Chapman was largely responsible for feeding these false coordinates back to Berlin. But it's reinforced because you, you'd be a double agent, and then you'd, you'd recruit more, mm. mostly fictional yep. characters. So, so, you know, Eddie Chapman would have, you know, sub-agents yep. he controlled, all of whom had real-life handlers controlling fictionalized mm. who would corroborate information. So, yeah. I mean... But they were all made up. Yeah, all completely fictional. Yeah. I mean, that's, they sort of approached it like novelists, in a way. I mean, the files for Chapman are hugely high because, as you say, mo there's lots and lots of entirely invented sub-agents. <laughs> Um, I mean, <laughs> and rather brilliantly, uh, British and American intelligence worked out what it was that the Abwehr, the German intelligence, wanted to believe. And one of the obsessions the Abwehr had, uh, totally farcical actually, was the idea that Wales, um, the Welsh valleys, were filled with sort of, na sort of nationalist, anti-British Nazis. That somehow if they could get to this kind of Welsh underground operation, they would, they would all rise up and, and overthrow the British government. They hadn't spent much time in They'd Wales. They'd never been to no. Wales. Yeah. And needless to say, no such thing existed. Um, but because the, they knew that the Germans wanted to believe this, they invented the Welsh Aryan Brotherhood. <laughs> which were just, I mean, they were, honestly, they were just these made-up Welshmen. Um, <laughs> supposedly, get, and, and they had a lot of fun, I think, as well, sort of feeding this stuff back. But of course, the key thing is that because of Bletchley Park, and, and Chapman didn't know this. Everything he sent back and everything that the Germans were then saying to each other in their different stations was being read by Britain. So they could, they could work out whether he was on side or not, whether he was trying to play them against the middle. And, and so he didn't know that, but they were secretly checking up on him the whole time. What happened with his Iron Cross? Uh, well, he, ha he, he came... Wonderfully, Eddie Chapman came back um, to Britain in 1945 um, and was kicked out of MI5 immediately um, uh, and went straight back to being a crook um, <laughs> and, and was running huge sort of smuggling rings and gangsters. But he ended up as the crime correspondent of the Daily Telegraph, <laughs> which I, I just think is completely marvellous that he ended up sort of reporting on himself. But the Iron Crosses, yeah, no, he had the Iron Cross and he sold the Iron Cross when he was down on his luck. But then I discovered that he sold it again, <laughs> and again, <laughs> and again. I know of at least five iron crosses that Eddie Chapman sold. He would simply go to a second-hand shop, buy another iron cross, and say to someone, this is the one I was given. <laughs> he was a tremendous crook. I, very good fun, too. But, but, the, but it, yes, no, so the ch being able to check up on Chapman was absolutely vitally part of it, I think. Absolutely. Uh, should we open up? Yes, let's see. Should we, should we open up questions? for some questions? Mm. Gentlemen Please. over here. Very good question. All, all of my sources are good at deception, so how do I know that what, they're, what they are reporting is true? Well, one of the great pleasures of working in this area is that spies are... Well, first of all, spies are tremendously indiscreet. <laughs> I mean, they love telling their stories. <laughs> they're also hugely unreliable narrators of their own story. So part of the fun is trying to work out when they're lying and when they're telling the truth. But one of the great advantages, in, in, I'm, and I'm very lucky in this, in what I write, is that the British government has begun to release systematically its classified files. So MI5 every year dumps a huge amount of material. It's redacted quite a lot of it, but it's original. And what makes those files so fascinating is that they are, they're written by and for people who believe they will remain secret forever. That they're never supposed to be read like by people like me or you. And so, therefore, they're, they're honest. They don't try to cover up when it goes wrong. Most government files, uh, I've found uh, over the course of being a journalist for 25 years, are fairly deceptive. They're designed to give a particular impression of what's happening. They're designed to make the writer look good and somebody else look bad. Well, well with these intelligence files, they're subtly very different. They're kind of honest in a way that most government files aren't. So when it goes wrong... They actually write in the margins, this is a total cock-up, you know, we're, 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 in, we're in real trouble here. So, so you actually get, you, you get a real sense of what is genuinely happening, and you can use those official files, secret official files, to check against what spies say about themselves. And so Chapman wrote a wonderfully uh, mendacious memoir himself after the war, most of which is complete fiction. Uh, and, but you can set it against 
the actual files to work out where he's lying and where he isn't. So, so that's the sort of long answer to your question. And the great pleasure is also, I mean, it, it, this is less true now. It's one of the reasons why I'm moving towards the Cold War is having living witnesses is, is just gold dust in this stuff because you can actually get people to tell you what it was like, what it smelled like, you know, what the weather was like. And that's kind of, that's critical for the kind of books that I write because you can actually give them some texture and so on. Sir? Well, I don't know an awful lot about John Walker. He was the Navy spy, wasn't he? He was the sort of CIA North Navy spy. Yeah, at Norfolk. I mean, it's one of the... It's, it, the more I write about this stuff, the more I realise that while Britain was heavily penetrated by Soviet spies, there were a lot more American spies than anybody's ever really wanted to look at. I mean, the McCarthy, the McCarthy witch hunts were terrible, but actually, in some ways... They were not entirely wrong. There were an awful lot of, of Soviet and communist sympathizers around. Now, I don't know if John Walker was himself a, a communist. I think he did it mostly for money, didn't he? Well, his son, I think, Andrew, and his wife That's Barbara right. Were That's right. There was rather a good book about them recently, wasn't there? Yeah, no, I mean, I think, you know, the, the, the penetration of the American military and, and intelligence establishment by, by Soviet intelligence hasn't really been written yet. And it will be, and the CIA is under pressure to, to produce a lot of its evidence. Um, but I've come across, in the course of doing Oleg's story, I've come across at least two, um, one in the C CIA and one in the NSA, who've never really been written about, who, who, who aims exposed. I mean, you know, who, who, who aims sort of identified. So there's a, there's a big book to be written about that, I think. But I, I'm not great on Walker, I'm afraid. Um, Madam? The question was, when was Aldrich Ames finally exposed? <coughs> the amazing thing is it, it didn't happen for 11 years. So for 11 years, he was systematically betraying every single Soviet asset, actually Sovblok asset, every single intelligence source that the CIA had behind the Iron Curtain w that, that uh, Ames knew about was being exposed. And there's two extraordinary elements to that. One is that Ames was himself... A really very, uh, I mean, he, his work record was very poor. I mean, he shouldn't really have been allowed to stay in the CIA, even as a CIA officer. I mean, he was, it was regularly said that he was drinking too much, he was out of control, he shouldn't have been there. And yet somehow, as often happens in big organizations, the sort of momentum of his career just kind of continued, even though he wasn't very good. So that's one of the things. And meanwhile, he was buying ever bigger houses, more and more Jaguars. You know, I mean, it was kind of, going on more and more expensive holidays with his, with his Colombian wife. I, I mean, why somebody didn't spot very early on that this man was not living on the $45,000 a year CIA salary was, is just <laughs> extraordinary. But they, they, they got him in the end. Um, it's the old Al Capone story. They got him in the end on the tax return. Um, but it took a long time. I mean, he's, he's in an Arizona prison now where he is going to stay, I suspect, uh, for a very, very long time. I mean, his motivation is interesting because he's, he's so different from it. Oleg is such an ideologue. I, he's sort of motivated by this rather sort of Russian, whole-souled commitment to an idea. Whereas Ames is, is, in a way, quite honest about it. In his own writings, he says, I did it for the money. I did it for the cash. So I've got that lovely contrast, really. But, yeah. The question was, who recruited the Cambridge Five? Well, the answer is a wonderfully charismatic KGB recruiter called Arnold Deutsch, um, who was a Czech by birth, a, a, a committed communist, uh, who arrived in London in the early 30s. His cover, he was an illegal. His cover was uh, that he was a lecturer at UCL, University College London. And he just, by, almost entirely by personal magnetism, he, he recruited these young men who were either at university still or just leaving, and he was, he was incredibly charming, he was very funny, he was very generous. They all write about him, and it's one of the sort of odder things about spying is that no effective spy ever believes that the relationship they have with their spy master is just a, a contractual one. They all believe, and, and this is true of every spy I've ever come across, they believe that their relationship with their, with their case officer, with their handler, is somehow more profound than that. That it's some kind of ideological and personal 
contact that goes on. And Arnold Deutsch was, was extraordinarily effective. I mean, he, he almost single-handedly, not just in Cambridge, there was actually an Oxford spy ring as well. They weren't very good. Um, I say that <laughs> as an ex-Cambridge man. Um, <laughs> they, um, but they, um, but no, he was, he was tremendously effective. And, he, uh, and he, he came with two brothers. Do you have Odeon cinemas in, in America? Is Odeon a cinema chain? Well, you might like to know that, that Odeon, there were two brothers. It was Arnold Deutsch and Oscar Deutsch. And Oscar Deutsch set up the Odeon cinema chain because Odeon stands for Oscar Deutsch Educates Our Nation. So one brother was a, was a KGB recruiter and the other was a hugely successful cinema franchise owner. <laughs> Brilliant. I'm, I'm afraid we're out of time. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you very much. much.